How's it going, folks? So, um, of course, uh, making this presentation for my history graduate students, as well as history undergraduate students who are working on writing a research paper. Uh, and so, of course, in this PowerPoint, I'm going to be mostly going over just the general structure uh, and components uh, that you want to make sure to uh, include in your research paper, especially when you're writing a research paper uh, as uh, from the discipline of history or as a historian or using a historical approach, right? And so uh, just a brief disclaimer, these tips are not for writing a historiographical essay, uh, which is of course how we do lit review in history. Uh, so do not confuse a research paper with a historiography paper. If you're watching this to write a historiography, uh, please exit now. And uh, in this video, I'll discuss uh, sort of just some of the elements that I would expect you to have uh, in an introduction in the body paragraphs uh, in the, when you're providing historical background, a lit review or historiography, uh, and also touching on the conclusion uh, and bibliography uh, section. Uh, and so I'm not going to be going into all of these into too much detail. I'm just going over mostly uh, what are my expectations or generally what are expectations uh, and perhaps I would uh, imagine, right, our expectations that are shared by uh, your professors or your instructors. Uh, and so I'll be going more into uh, providing historical background uh, subjects such as providing more background in the bibliography and such uh, in a separate video. So for now, I'm just going over the components of the research paper. Uh, so let's talk about the introduction section. So uh, just before even talking about um, about this um, I do want to point out that some Chicago style guides uh, that you might find on the internet um, might discuss uh, having uh, or asking you all to have an abstract or a cover page uh, for your uh, final papers. So for my classes, and I would imagine for most of your history cl uh, classes, uh, no abstract is expected. So when you're turning in the final draft of your paper, I do not expect an abstract. Um, I also uh, do not expect you all to have a cover page just uh, include your last name and the page number uh, on the upper right hand corner uh, of the header, as you see here in this example. Um, as far as how long the introduction section should be, right? I know we usually are used to writing uh, the one, uh, the standard one paragraph uh, introduction uh, for our essays, right? But um, of course, um, in the when you're writing a history research paper, uh, multiple paragraphs encompassing an entire introduction section are acceptable as well, right? So you're, you could have your first, let's say five, uh, three or four paragraphs could be an introduction. Uh, just my tip for that is uh, when you're, if you decide to take this approach, right? So a, um, going beyond one paragraph for your introduction, uh, just, just do not let it drag on, right? Uh, I would not recommend going more than five pages or more than three to five pages for graduate students, uh, for undergraduates. One paragraph uh, is usually expected uh, to us fine, but again, make sure that uh, the introduction paragraph is not as long as uh, your body paragraphs, right? Uh, so that's just sort of a, a warning from my perspective. Um, and um, these rules might vary, right? So definitely for your other classes, definitely check in with your professors if they have different expectations with regard to how long the intro should be. Uh, other things that you might want to consider including in your introduction paragraphs, uh, you can also incorporate uh, some historical background uh, or historical context, right, uh, of the subject, the subject that you are um, addressing or subjects. Uh, and um, another thing, uh, another way that you can potentially start your introduction section uh, you, is you can start off with a story directly from uh, perhaps one of your primary sources or secondary sources. Uh, so, for example, uh, for a, a master's paper I wrote, I forget which class this was, uh, I was writing a paper on an immigrants' rights organization in Los Angeles called uh, the Los Angeles Committee for the Protection of the Foreign Born. And so I began this paper talking about uh, one of the stories mentioned in one of my uh, sources, which discussed a U.S. citizen who had traveled to Tijuana, Mexico, uh, and uh, she had her citizenship revoked while she was traveling because she was suspected of being a communist. Uh, and of course, at that time, you could lose your citizenship uh, if you were, of course, uh, targeted, right, and singled out for this reason. Uh, 
uh, by the appropriate authorities. And so she was not allowed back uh, to enter. She was not allowed entry back into the U.S. Uh, because of her communist affiliation. So uh, I use this story to sort of uh, interest the reader, right, to grab the reader's attention and also to help set the stage for my arguments. I don't remember exactly what that argument was. Uh, I remember, though, it was something along the lines of how I was pointing out that although this person was Mexican, uh, Mexican-American woman, uh, that her allies were from an organization that was composed of people from various uh, nationalities. So kind of talking about more of the sort of this historical legacy, right, of, uh, uh, of multi-ethnic activism, right? Um, and uh, another thing, uh, that you might want to consider incorporating uh, is maybe talking a little bit about the literature or the secondary sources um, that you're using. So maybe you could uh, include a sentence or two about what other scholars have said about the topic uh, and maybe where you agree or disagree, or maybe you can state where you want to add to their findings, right? So, um, uh, so for example, uh, in the paper I mentioned earlier, a concerning the Los Angeles Committee for the Protection of the Foreign Born, I did point out that someone already did write an article on this organization and that uh, my point uh, in writing that paper was not only to add to their findings, but also to put it into this context of the history of, um, of mass deportations, right, uh, in history. Uh, so uh, anyways, those are just some approaches you can take uh, and the example here, um, this is part of the introduction paragraphs that I had for this essay I wrote long ago. Um, but uh, I, uh, here I'm sort of mostly just talking about some of the groups, introducing some of the groups I'm talking about. Uh, I do have a footnote citation uh, regarding how other scholars have talked about these two groups that I have mentioned uh, in the citation. But uh, I will include a, a PDF printout of this if you all want to uh, take a look at some of these screenshots. Okay. Um, let's continue on talking about other elements you can include in your introduction. Uh, so other things you might want to consider including is maybe talking about your theoretical framework or the approach that you are using to tell the narrative. Uh, so for example, uh, in my own research, right, I've talked about uh, masculinity scholarship, which is uh, a field that has been pioneered in many cases, I would argue, right, by psychologists. Uh, and um, also, right, uh, I've used um, the framework of hypermas. what well, I discussed hypermasculinity, right, as a framework for looking at my colonial sources. Uh, and I've also explored the colonial masculinity, which is uh, something that uh, the historian Brina Lini Sinha has talked about uh, in her work on uh, the, uh, the history of the colonization uh, of India. Uh, so again, that's a uh, this is sort of one way that you might want to consider uh, using your introduction. So maybe if there's a, a frame of reference uh, or an approach that you're planning to use, uh, the introduction section is where you want to articulate your approach, right? So uh, are you using perhaps uh, in the context of of gender, right? Are you are you exploring masculinity? Are you exploring femininities? Is there a particular author whose work you're modeling uh, your paper after? Okay, so things to think about. Um, and uh, most importantly, right, the introduction should be telling us the who, what, where, when, how uh, components of your research paper, right? So well, who are the historical actors? What events are we talking about? Where did this event take place? When did it take place? And how did it take place? And perhaps uh, why, is this, why is this important? Uh, so um, I touch a little bit of, uh, on this in the assignment descriptions I have uh, in the syllabus. So uh, make sure to refer to that uh, uh, for additional guidance, uh, as well as some of the guides I posted online. Uh, other things as well, right, uh, that the very most important thing, uh, of course, that you should have in your introduction section uh, is your thesis statement. Okay, so you want to make sure you have your thesis statement, which lays out your argument for the entire paper. That should be articulated, right, in the introduction section. Uh, typically, that should be uh, in the, um, uh, in the, well, this is also where I have run into some debate with some folks, but ideally, right, this wants this should be articulated in the first par, uh, in the first paragraph. But I've seen some folks do it in the last paragraph of their introduction section, uh, or the second to last paragraph 
right? Uh, but just the point of the matter is here is that make sure that your thesis statement, that it's clear uh, and that it's articulated in the introduction section, okay? Uh, and lastly, another thing that you can incorporate into the introduction section uh, is perhaps you could include um, a, a few sentences or perhaps uh, a smaller paragraph where you state the direction or the structure of your research paper. So uh, I don't know if you heard, if you caught how I earlier mentioned that some folks put the thesis statement uh, in the second to last paragraph um, of their introduction section. The reason I mentioned this is that sometimes folks will use the last section of their introduction uh, to provide a sort of a, an overview of the remainder of the outline uh, of their research paper. Uh, so just to reiterate, right, you can have a, a short section on your introduction uh, where you state something along the lines of, you know, in the first section, I provide, for example, historical background on X, Y, Z. In the second section, I discuss why this is the case. And third, I describe this. And finally, I show how X, Y, Z, right? So just kind of uh, giving a general uh, example of what that might uh, look like. Granted, right, it would sound much more polished than how I described in that example. Okay, uh, what about body paragraphs? So uh, first off, obviously, right, the body paragraphs are gonna be the largest component of your essay. Uh, and uh, this is, of course, in these body paragraphs is where you prove your, go uh, seek to prove your arguments and you present your findings, right? So this is largely where you, pr um, uh, where you provide an interpretation, right, of your primary sources. Uh, and uh, another note is that um, in terms of your body paragraphs, right, I know I've had some folks who just uh, just start writing right after the introduction section, uh, but um, what uh, folks generally do, or uh, I've seen graduate students generally doing, right, is dividing their uh, body paragraphs into three or more sections, sometimes two sections, uh, and each of these sections, of course, uh, will be divided by a different header. Um, and so how many you choose to do, I leave up to you. You can even do subsections. So as you see in the example I have here, right, um, uh, this is actually a subsection of a, of a greater section um, in this essay that I have. Um, and, um, and apologies for the crummy writing. This was like some of my earlier drafts uh, of, my, um, of my earlier work. Uh, but anyways, right. Uh, so um, whether or not you all choose to divide them into sections or subsections, uh, I leave them up to you. Uh, I have had students who just uh, write without dividing their paper into sections, but uh, granted, right, uh, the only downside to that is that it can sometimes make it hard, uh, less obvious for the reader to follow your points, right? But again, right, I leave that up to you, okay, uh, whether or not you choose to include subsections or not. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that uh, each section, they can reflect different parts of your findings or your arguments. So in terms of how you decide to title your subsections, so here I'm talking about, for example, how the sources feminize the Mexica or Aztecs. Um, and here I'm specifically talking about uh, uh, a primary source relating to how uh, Tarascan or Purepecha elites uh, viewed the Aztecs or the Mexica, right? So that's sort of one subsection that I have here. Um, and, um, uh, but again, right, uh, not all of your subsections, I should also point out, uh, necessarily have to be where you provide um, uh, just an interpretation of your primary sources, right? So some of your subsections, uh, so for example, if it's a subsection on historical background, or if it's a subsection on the lit review, obviously, right, uh, if you choose to do a historical background or lit review in a separate uh, into a separate section, right? Uh, the majority of the sources that you use in that section uh, by implication, right, uh, are likely mostly going to be secondary sources. Okay, uh, so on that note, right, the historical background or the literature review components of your essay, you can do them as a separate section within your essay. Uh, at, but as I'll talk about um, uh, in th these next few slides, uh, you can also incorporate them into other uh, sections of your essay. So let me talk a little bit about that uh, as well.
Uh, so providing historical background or historical context. Uh, so the point of providing historical background and historical context is, of course, to give the reader a brief introduction to what historical events you are covering. Um, and of course, this is important, right? Because you don't want to assume that your reader already knows about the historical events in question. Okay. Um, and just my tip for this when you're providing historical background is to not make this section too long. You know, try to keep it concise. I would say, um, personally, this is just me. I would say uh, no more than one to two, uh, uh, one to two pages, perhaps no more five, more, no more than five paragraphs. But again, right, that's just me providing my own um, subjective argument. Right, um, this might vary depending on your professors. Uh, but uh, again, right, uh, just. Uh, my point with this is the readers, when they're reading a research paper, they want to know what's your unique insights or findings, right? Uh, they don't want to know um, uh, things that uh, uh, basically, right, you don't want to uh, repeat what other authors, simply repeating what other authors are saying, uh, right? Uh, most of your essays should give us, right, uh, your own insights um, from the readings, okay? So again, don't make your historical background section too long. Um, and essentially what you're doing in this section uh, is you're summarizing the events that took place for those who may not be familiar with the historical event uh, you're mentioning in question. Okay, so in this section is where you want to provide that background, right? Um, uh, and as far as where you want to put the historical context, I leave this up to you. Uh, you can include this in the introduction section of your essay. So for example, in the example that I have listed here, uh, this is uh, where I have, um, I'm introducing the historical event in question at the very beginning of the essay. So this is on the first page. Um, and uh, never mind the footnote numbers here, but because uh, this was part of a larger um, graduate portfolio that I submitted. But uh, anyways, this was the first page, right, of this research essay. Uh, and so again, right, um, you can choose to include that historical background in the introduction section or you can uh, make a completely new uh, section, right, um, uh, in your body paragraphs that specifically um, provides just historical background. Okay, um, what else do I wanna say here? So, um, I'm sorry, I lost my point here. <laughs> okay, uh, the last point I do wanna make here is that uh, I would want you to pay attention to how uh, some of the secondary sources that you are gonna be reading uh, pay attention to the sort of the methods or the ways that they incorporate historical background and context. I think that you will find, right, that not every historian uses this, the same approach uh, to providing historical background. Again, you'll see some folks who do the historical background in the introduction uh, and some who, uh, who might uh, incorporate them into just one of the sections in their body paragraphs or disperse them throughout the body paragraphs. That's also something I've seen uh, as well. And so what about the historiography or the lit review section uh, of your essay? Uh, so uh, what's neat, what I mean by this is that somewhere in your essay, you need to have uh, some sort of a discussion of how other historians or scholars uh, from your secondary sources, of course, how did they address or how did they discuss or debate uh, your topic, right? Or uh, how, um, and maybe this is also where you can talk about where you agree or disagree, uh, maybe talk ab about their sources. Okay, so for those of you who have already taken a historiography class or a class where you had to write a historiographical essay, those are some of the elements you're going to want to include uh, in this section, right? Um, and so just a note on the historiography also, right, in terms of um, where to put it. Uh, you don't necessarily have to do a separate section uh, of the uh, for historiography, but you can do that if you want. Uh, as you see in the example here, I have on the left, on the right. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm talking about how this uh, how this third gender subject right has been depicted uh, um, over time, right? So one of the earliest works that I have here cited is um, a 1968 work by Carolyn Baus de Citrom, uh, and then. I start talking about later works, such as uh, this work published in 2003 by Richard Trexler, and um, and I end uh, this sort of short lit review component talking about uh, Ida Altman's 2010 uh, text, The War for Mexico's West. So uh, this is an example here of a historiography, right? Uh, that's probably a bit more on the concise side, 
Um, but again, right, uh, where you decide to include this, uh, I leave it up to you. I've seen some folks do uh, this, uh, uh, the lit review component, they might integrate it instead into their uh, introduction section. Uh, and they'll do that to sort of talk about, uh, introduce their essay, talking about where they disagree with their sources. Uh, and then of course, use that uh, as a way to sort of, um, to construct their argument, right? Basically articulating why they disagree with those sources and essentially have constructing a thesis statement saying uh, where they state uh, where their opinion or where their perspectives differ and, and why, okay. Uh, so again, in terms of where you decide to include the lit review or historiography section, I leave that up to you. You can make it its own section. You can incorporate it into the uh, introduction, right? Uh, but the point of the matter is, is that I want to see that you'll have some sort of discussion about how your secondary sources have addressed this topic um, of, over time, okay? Uh, and again, like the historical context component of your history research es uh, essay, um, I'm sorry, historical background, um, uh, similar to that, uh, the historical context section of your essay, uh, there's no quantifiable or recommended limit on how long this section, right, the lit review, uh, I don't really have a limit on how long it should be. Uh, I've seen some students and colleagues of mine who've wrote, written really great essays and articles, book chapters, um, with a very long historiography paragraph um, or just have done a very brief historiography. I've seen some folks that have a historiography section that is four or five pages uh, in length, roughly speaking. And I would imagine that on a Microsoft Word document, uh, that would probably be more than five pages. Uh, and uh, we see an example of a very extensive historiography uh, in the Francis Cartoonin essay on Malinche uh, that we'll be reading in this class as well. Uh, and so uh, if you want to get an, ex an idea of how other authors incorporate historiography, again, right, uh, pay attention to the way the ways that your uh, sources do that, right, uh, specifically your secondary sources. Um, another tip that I do have uh, for uh, the historiography section, and this is more in relation uh, to uh, choosing the works, right, uh, that you will cite uh, for your secondary sources. One thing you want to make sure is that uh, you want to have a, a, a wide variety of sources, secondary sources that are, riff, are written at different time periods. So you should have, for example, some of the oldest works um, relating to your subject, uh, as well as some of those that are the most recent, right? So uh, for example, in my case, right, um, the oldest work uh, that um, discusses uh, this subject that I'm talking about, um, this third gender uh, individual, uh, the earliest work that I found that talks about this person was published in 1968. So that's why I have it included here, right? And then I have another work uh, published in 2003 and another in 2010, right? So uh, make sure you're including a wide variety of works, right? And uh, another thing to keep in mind that I do mention uh, in uh, the syllabus, right? I forget which discussion it was, but uh, another thing to think about also, right, is uh, uh, is to think about also if there is a historian or a scholar who's known for researching a particular subject, right? You want to make sure that uh, you you don't um, don't omit right some of those what would might be considered right an important work uh, in that field. So, like, let's say uh, if you're studying, let's say, uh, masculinity scholarship, uh, it might be important uh, to cite. Uh, um, Sorry, I'm forgetting uh, the name. Oh yes, uh, Raywin Connell's work. Okay, who's uh, been a pioneer in masculinity studies. Uh, her work has been widely shared. Perhaps you could uh, cite an article from her. Or, for example, if you're doing something on Malin Sin, right? Uh, Francis Cartunin's essay is very um, uh, is considered is in many ways right considered a monumental work on that subject, uh, as well as. Uh, the book, um, I'm forgetting the name of the author, but it's called Malin Sin's Choices. But anyways, the point here is, right, is try to uh, make sure that you're including work that, um, think about including work that might also be considered key in the field. Uh, and one way to do that is to see if there's an author or a scholar or two that you see most of your secondary sources uh, citing. Um, Okay, and also returning to this question uh, that I mentioned in the historical background section. So uh, 
uh, as far as how many sources you all should be citing, um, how many secondary sources, um, I, of course, do have a limit for this assignment, but uh, in terms of how many should be of these sources should be uh, older sources and how many of these should be sources that were published recently in the 2000s, um, I, I leave that up to you, but I expect you all at least to have one of uh, at least one source that was uh, that's more on the older side, so works published uh, any time in the in the 20th centuries and beforehand, right, as well as more recent works published uh, in the 2000s. Okay, um, and uh, another tip that I do have on that, right, because I know I've had uh, students in the past who um, were having difficulties looking for uh, secondary sources that. Uh, address some of the topics that they were studying. Uh, so for example, um, I had uh, one student in uh, my race and immigration class uh, who was uh, studying uh, Ar Armenian immigration. And so um, they were not able to find uh, books that specifically talked about uh, Armenian migrants uh, that were published before the 1990s. Uh, but I believe, uh, I don't remember the name of the text, but they did find a book that was published in the 1980s that talked about uh, European immigration, broadly speaking, uh, and it had mentioned uh, Armenians in passing uh, within, of course, that larger context of immigration history. Uh, so uh, they included that as one of the citations, right? Uh, and so, and um, and of course, use that as an example of how uh, Armenians were understudied, right, uh, in the literature of the late 20th century. So. Uh, that's also something to keep in mind, right? So uh, if you see a work that maybe addresses your topic from a peripheral perspective or in passing, uh, that might be something you might want to incorporate as well. You know, just because uh, your historical subject is not in the title, right, of the book or the article, does it mean that it would may not provide some valuable insights, right? Um, other things as well uh, to pay attention to uh, in the coming weeks, right, is Think about what what methods your authors used, right, to provide uh, the uh, the historiography components of the essay. Now, last but not least, let's talk about con the conclusion section. Of course, this is where you're not only going to be wrapping up your arguments. Uh, this is where I expect you all to restate your uh, thesis statement uh, and summarize uh, some of, uh, summarize your overall findings. Uh, other suggestions that you all can do uh, to, um, uh, to if you're having trouble with including more content, I guess, in your conclusion section, uh, some things you can do is maybe provide some points of re reflection. And what I mean by that is maybe think about what further work might be needed to be done in this field. So maybe uh, as you were working on your paper, you probably thought about other things that could be studied with regard to this topic or you noted that there was something that uh, the uh, that other authors have not covered, uh, but that you, um, of course, cannot cover within the scope or context of your paper, right? So perhaps you found another potential topic that you might want to work on in the future um, that no one has done. So that's something that you can mention as well, right? So for example, uh, you could say something along the lines of, you know, there needs to be further work on X, Y, and Z population or on how X, Y, and Z impacts um, women during this time period or, or, or men or X, Y, or et cetera, right? Um, so again, reflecting on, on what further work might need to be done is a possible approach. Uh, you can also talk about how did your work contribute uh, to the scholarship, right? So, um, you know, so what's your overall contribution uh, reflecting points? Uh, and um, another thing, I, I guess I don't have it listed here, is maybe you can include uh, some, um, I guess you could say some, I guess, uh, example or uh, or story, right, from one of your primary sources. But uh, one thing I do want to caution, right, is uh, what not to do. So one thing you don't want to do in the conclusion section is, first of all, do not provide new evidence, right? So although I did mention, right, that you could perhaps use one of your primary sources, or a quote from your primary sources, um, you know, maybe you could use that for, I guess, for poetic ends, right? A way to sort of wrap up uh, or uh, one of your points right from the conclusion, um, which is fine. But again, right, don't introduce a primary source for the purpose of introducing a new argument, right? Uh, whatever you did, arguments you 
uh, did not, uh, whatever arguments you did state throughout the body paragraphs, you should be reiterating those in the conclusion. Okay. And how long should this section be, right? So uh, I often get this question. I recommend that for the conclusion section, obviously write one paragraph is the minimum. Two to three pages is okay. Um, if you go decide to go beyond that, that's fine. Uh, just, uh, but that's, those are my general guidelines. I would, uh, I don't necessarily have a preference for that. Okay, and what about the bibliography or works cited section? Okay, uh, so first of all, I do want to emphasize that the bibliography or works cited section, it needs to be its own separate page, right? I sometimes get folks who write, uh, will begin the bibliography in the section right after they finished uh, their uh, writing uh, their essay, okay. Uh, so, and sometimes the bibliography might appear somewhere like halfway uh, through uh, uh, through the page, right? So uh, just a pet peeve of mine, right? I just, I strongly urge you all to, of course, um, have a separate bibliography page. So uh, once you're, uh, once you're, once you finish with your conclusion section, I strongly urge you all to use the page breaks and uh, the page break option from Word. Uh, don't just hit the enter button until you your text reaches the next page, right? Um, uh, because what often happens, right, is that uh, I've had students who will submit their papers to me on Canvas or Blackboard, and um, and because they hit the enter button numerous times for the bibliography page, uh, sometimes the bibliography on my screen or after I download it, uh, it ends up uh, appearing way differently. Um, or it does that thing where it uh, appears midway uh, through the end of the uh, of one of the pages, right? Or it appears somewhere halfway in one of the one of the pages. So again, right? I just strongly urge using the page break option. Uh, don't just hit enter. Um, and lastly, right? Uh, pay attention also to the Chicago style um, uh, the the Chicago style formatting. Uh, in the bibliography, right? So of course, um, ordering your sources A through Z, uh, as you see here, I am asking folks uh, to uh, separate into primary and secondary sources. Um, and um, of course, following Chicago style uh, formatting uh, and also organizing these uh, in uh, A through Z order, right? Um, so as you see here, the primary sor uh, sources A through Z, secondary sources A through Z. Um, other things to note, right, is that uh, the individual citations in the bibliography, notice that they're single spaced with a space in between. Okay, so please make sure uh, that you all are uh, cognizant uh, of that or aware of that. I'm, excuse me, I did not want to use that phrasing. Um, apologies. Um, yes, okay. Try not to use uh, phrasing that may come off as ableist, so I apologize if that uh, came off in that way. Uh, so also some other final pointers. Uh, so as far as formatting, right? So before you submit your final paper, uh, make sure that um, uh, that your paper is written in Times New Roman font, 12 point font, double spaced, of course, one inch margins. Um, and I know this might sound elementary to some of y'all, but uh, I am reiterating this because I always get a handful of papers that do not follow these uh, instructions. Uh, another thing also, right, is that um, I, I have had folks in the past who do not uh, indent uh, their paragraphs, and, and I totally understand, especially from folks who are coming from uh, universities in other parts of the world where uh, they don't do uh, indentations, right, uh, for every paragraph. So just a reminder, right, to indent each of your paragraphs uh, makes it easier, uh, the start of your paragraphs, because this makes it easier for me. Uh, in terms of um, not just uh, reading your essay, but following your arguments as well. Um, as for uh, Chicago style formatting uh, as well. So another thing I want to point out for footnotes in Chicago, uh, as you see down here, uh, make sure that uh, you're following the, you're doing the first line indent, uh, making sure that they're single spaced uh, with a space uh, in between each note. Okay, so. Um, for further details on this, make sure to refer to the uh, style guides that I have posted um, and also links to the Chicago uh, style guides. The last point uh, that I want to um, talk about, right, is um, uh, for the overall essay is 
don't abuse quotes. Uh, and uh, I've had this problem before with uh, students in both graduate and undergraduate courses. Uh, so um, I strongly urge my students uh, to paraphrase, okay? Uh, for my graduate students, uh, I am allowing a max of two quotes, two sentences per page, uh, and the max that uh, my graduates, graduate students can use for their essays are a max of two block quotes for the entire essay, not per page, for the entire essay, a maximum of two block quotes. Um, I also would urge you to stay within the page limit. Uh, I am okay if like you go, let's say five or seven pages, uh, but please do not go, um, let's say 10 pages uh, beyond, right? So what I am asking for. Uh, and here I'm specifically referring to uh, the page limit on written text. I'm not talking ab uh, about the bibliography, right? Um, and I think this is, uh, found this video on TikTok, right? Um, where this uh, professor mentions this. So as an adjunct professor myself, I sympathize with this as well. Uh, in the bottom here, uh, she writes, uh, please do not do this to your professors, especially adjuncts. <laughs> We're not paid enough to deal uh, with this. Uh, so uh, she shows here that uh, she assigned a paper that was only three to four pages uh, and the students gave them uh, somewhere around 30 or 40 pages, I don't recall. So let's take a look. Alrighty, folks. Well, that is it for now. And if y'all have any additional questions, uh, you all know where to reach me. Uh, and good luck on your final papers.